G'day, I'm James Tanton, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you for this series and to share with you what I believe to be a key component to joyful mathematics success, the art of being visual. They say a picture can speak a thousand words. Well, in mathematics, a picture can spawn a thousand ideas. A picture can provide deep understanding. A picture can prompt that aha moment to cause an idea or process to suddenly make sense. A picture can lead to finally understanding a tricky piece of mathematics. And that's what this course is about. I want to share an alternative way in to the subject, a way to think about topics and see, truly see what they are really about and how to make them work for you. Now, the ideas can be elementary or they could be advanced. It really does not matter. All mathematics, all levels of mathematics, if thought about with intentionality, naturally lead to beautiful, clever, and powerful ideas. Whether a simple study of counting or study of tricky probability theory, every piece of mathematics serves as a portal for further thought and wonder. In this course, I will show you how. The story of visual thinking in mathematics is a very personal one for me. I grew up in Australia, and my mathematical training in my K-12 days wasn't particularly enlightened. This was back in the 70s. We were taught algorithms, arithmetic algorithms in primary school, algebra algorithms in high school, and so on. And I got the message loud and clear that my job was just to do and not to question. But I wanted to know why these algorithms worked. I wanted to know why negative times negative is positive, other than just being told it is. I want to know why all the patterns in Pascal's triangle work the way they do, and so on. But I learned early on I was not to ask questions. My job was just to perform. And perhaps your experience was similar to mine. Perhaps you too want to know why. We can all thank heavens that mathematics education is much more enlightened today. But there was something in me that compelled me to make sense of things nonetheless. I had pictures. The very early, early grades in my schooling were all about pictures. We drew shapes and counted dots. And we did all sorts of wonderful visual things, all good stuff. But then matters changed from grade four onwards for me. Working with pictures was no longer considered valid, no longer valid mathematics. Their status changed to that of simplistic tool suitable only for the very young. Our job was now to think analytically through equations and numbers on the page and not visually. But something in me kept hold of visual thinking nonetheless, privately in my mind. I knew, for me, pictures were a key to understanding, even for the mathematics given only in equations and words. So let me show you what I mean. Here are some examples from basic arithmetic. OK, division. I remember in my early grades circling groups of dots and pictures to make sense of division. For example, the division problem 18 divided by 3 is asking, how many groups of three can you find in a picture of 18 dots? Well, there are six of them. Super, 18 divided by three is six. And then I remember years later having the realization that I can push this visual picture further and make sense of some complicated division problems. For example, 808 divided by 98. I could just see it had to be eight for the remainder of 24. Here's what my brain imagined. We're looking for groups of 100 rather than 98. The number 98 is just too hard for me to fathom. So look for groups of 100 instead. And we can see there will be eight of these groups with eight dots left over. Ah, but each group of 100 is itself off by two dots. We wanted groups of 98 after all. So we have an extra 16 dots floating around as well. So that makes for eight groups of 98 and a remainder of 16 and eight. That is a remainder of 24 dots. 808 divided by 98 is 8 with a remainder of 24. Just like I said, I could see it. Subtraction. When asked to do 34 take away 18, I could certainly do the standard algorithm and get the answer 16. But can't we just see in our minds that the answer just has to be 2 plus 10 plus 4, which is 16? Line up a row of 34 blocks and a row of 18 blocks side by side. And now we can see that the two rows differ by 2 and 10 and 4 blocks. The difference is 16. In the same way, 1,012 take away 797 just has to be 3 and 212. That's 215. Can you see that? 
797 to 800 is 3. 800 to 1,000 is another 200. And the extra 12 gets me to 215 in total. Actually, this flexibility of thought helps subtraction in general. For example, look at 1,005 take away 387. All right, in the classic way of doing this, we have a lot of borrowing to do here. That is, we have to do 5 take away 7 requires a borrow. 0 take away 8 requires a borrow. 0 take away 3, yet another borrow. But we can make this work simpler. So here we're looking for the difference between 1,005 dots and 387 dots. So let's make the 1,005 friendlier and turn it into 1,000. Just remove 5 from each pile and let's just compute the difference between 1,000 and 382 instead. Now I can see in my head the answer has to be 8 and 10 and 600. 8 to get up to 390, 10 to get to 400, 600 to get up to 1,000. Total of 618. Ah, but if I don't trust my head and still want to do the traditional algorithm, then I suggest we move one more dot from each pile and make the problem 999 take away 381. Now I can do the algorithm without any borrowers whatsoever. 9 take away 1, fine. 9 take away 8, no problem. 9 take away 3, piece of cake. I've made the problem so much easier to do, even if someone insists that I use the algorithm. Fine. Multiplication. Isn't multiplication really a geometry problem? Isn't 24 times 13, say, just asking for the area of a rectangle that's 24 units wide and 13 units high? Then why not just chop the rectangle to pieces that are much more manageable? For example, think of 24 as 20 and 4, and 13 as 10 and 3. Then I can see that 24 times 13 must be the areas of the individual pieces added together. There's 200, there's 40, there's a 60, and a 12. That's 312. This type of visual thinking is only the beginning, the very beginning. These are pictures to go with grade school arithmetic, but we can mull on and tweak these pictures further and we'll see how they can provide gateways to so much more. For example, our picture of multiplication can be used to make perfect sense of why negative times negative is positive. And we'll do that in a bit later in the course. And we can make sense of expanding brackets in algebra class, which then takes us to advanced ideas such as connecting Pascal's triangle to algebra, and which will then take us to results in statistics and so on. Each picture we draw, like I said, serves as a portal to so much more. We'll see this over and over again throughout this course. For some reason, Visual thinking was in my bones from the get-go, and I actually think I know why. Back in Australia, back in those days in the 60s and 70s, my family owned an old Victorian house. It was my childhood home. And each room of the house had a pressed tin ceiling, and each had some de decorative design on it, and printed on in some way. And this included my bedroom. And I spent each and every night of my childhood falling asleep, staring at the design on my bedroom ceiling. And the design I had on my room was particularly striking. It was just a five by five grid of squares. Now the edges were vines and the corners were little flowers, but in the end, I was just staring at a grid of 25 squares each and every night. And what does a young lad do staring at a grid of squares each night? Well, he starts counting things. He starts counting interesting things. He makes up puzzles and mind games based on that grid of squares. And I remember my very first mathematics surprise coming from counting on that grid. It's this one. Clearly, there are 25 little one by one squares in the grid. But we can count two by two squares as well, and there are lots of those. I end up counting 16 in total. And then I counted the three by three squares, and there turns out to be nine of those. And the four by four squares, there are four of those. And finally, there is one big five by five square. Now, look at these counts. 25 one by one squares, 16 2 by 2 squares, 9 3 by 3 squares, 4 4 by 4 squares, and 1 5 by 5 square. Each count, 25, 16, 9, 4, 1, each count of squares is itself a square number. And I found this striking. I found it surprising, and I want to know the why behind this strange tautology. Counting squares on a square grid gives square number answers. And it took me a long while to figure out how to explain what was going on. My epiphany was to focus, I'm about to give it away, was to focus on the lower left corners of the squares I was counting. For example, 
Of the two by two squares, here are some possible lower left corners. Now let me draw all the possible lower left corners. And now I see that there's a square array of them. Four times four of them, in fact, that's 16. Thus, there are 16 two by two squares. This image just made it clear to me why the count of squares is always sure to be a square number. Very exciting. But there was one puzzle I made up for myself on this grid that I truly believe made me a mathematician. It wasn't until years after my schooling, in fact, doing university mathematics, that it came to me that I realized now I was doing visual thinking and was actually doing mathematics on that five by five grid of squares. I realized then that this bedroom ceiling was actually my portal to true mathematics. And I would encourage you to look for similar opportunity. Perhaps you too have ceiling tiles or wallpaper pattern or parquet floor or a tiled floor, something you look at every day. And once you start looking for these patterns, you'll be amazed at how many you'll find. So to explain the puzzle, the one that made me a mathematician, I want to work on an actual grid of squares with you. So let's head on over and do a demonstration. Okay, here it is, my bedroom ceiling, a five by five grid of squares. And here's the puzzle I invented for myself that I truly believe made me a mathematician. It goes as follows. So I chose a starting spot. So let's say I chose the top left corner. And the game I played for myself was, can I walk a path that visits each and every cell exactly once, just moving horizontally and vertically? And for example, I can actually do it. This one does work. So I'll start here, I'll mark my starting spot, and maybe I'll do a whole bunch of horizontal steps first. Maybe then one down step, vertical. Then maybe another bunch of horizontal steps. And then I keep going this way, maybe get a little bit crazy, but I can definitely find a path that does indeed visit each cell exactly once. Great, that was starting from the top left corner. Can I do it from a different position? Well, let's try it, let's find out. Say, how about starting from the middle of the side? Can I find a path that visits every cell exactly once? Well, let's try it. Uh, kind of random here, just get going. I'm gonna do something like this, uh, am I okay? Uh, oh, looking just fine. Great. All right, loads of fun. So I just kept going. In fact, let's choose another spot. Say choose the very middle one. All right, I'm gonna do it because I think, but I think I can see an answer right away. What if I just did a spiral? Can you see that's gonna work? Huh, so the middle position works as well. But then, here's the thing. I chose a different square like this one and matters seem to change. I'm gonna try this one. So maybe I'll start by going up, so a vertical step. Maybe I'll go over and I can do something like this. It looks pretty good. Maybe I'll come down, do a little zigzag. Okay, so far so good. Maybe I'll come around like this. I'm not nervous yet, looks fine. Oh, now I'm getting a bit nervous. So if I go up here, I've got to get to that cell, not miss it. But I've got all these over here, so maybe I'll do them, but then I'm stuck. I could do a, di a diagonal step, but I won't allow that. My game was only vertical and horizontal steps. So this cell, this one, I guess, what is it? One in from the middle was questionable. In fact, I tried it lots of different ways. Maybe I'll do something more like this, uh, 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 and I seem to get stuck. In fact, as a young lad, as I kept doing this, I always got stuck on that one. Well, let me try another one. Are there other cells that make you stuck? For example, let's try, I know, this one here. We haven't done that one yet. Well, let's do it. Give it a go, see what happens. So this feels fine so far. So I've got that half of the board done, or that, that two fifths of the board. Uh, maybe do something like this and get this portion of the board done. Looks good so far, actually, this is great. Maybe keep going. Uh, ooh, now I'm starting to get nervous because I kind of want to do something like either go up here and then I come over and I've got a choice, left or right, and I'm gonna get stuck. So maybe I should do this, but then I'm forced to go up there and I've got a choice again, I'm gonna get stuck. I can go one way, but not reach the other way. Hmm, so this cell here is troublesome as well. All right, so now, let's be a little systematic here. Some cells were definitely yes, I could do it because I did it. In fact, we've done it here. So let me get a clean grid yet again, and what I'll do now, as I'll be a little systematic and mark the cells that were yeses. For example, that cell, that was the very first example we tried. Yes, we definitely could find a path visiting every cell exactly once with horizontal and vertical steps, starting there. Oh, actually, let's be clever. 
We answer this corner cell as a yes. What about this corner cell? Must that be a yes as well? Well, if you think about it, actually, yes. Whatever solution we have here, just take your solution and turn it around 90 degrees, and that'll be a solution for the top right corner. So if the top left corner is a yes, the top right corner must also be a yes. Oh, and then take that solution and turn it another 90 degrees. That means this corner is a yes as well. In fact, all four corners must be yes cells. All right, so definitely four corners are yeses in this picture. Uh, we did the middle cell next. That was a yes. We actually did it. That little spiral was fine. Uh, what else did we do? We did the middle cell of a side, if I remember. So that was a yes. Ah, but then by symmetry again, rotating 90 degrees means this was a yes, this was a yes, and this was a yes. All right. Well, that looks pretty. Are there any more yeses in this picture? Hmm. Well, right now, we do have a couple of question marks. Now, we tried this one, and I only tried it once today. But I actually tried that cell for years as a kid, and I could never do it. But I must have been a strange child, because I never actually said the answer is no. Because I realized maybe I just didn't try hard enough. If I kept going, maybe I'll stumble upon the solution eventually. So I just was honest and said, this is still a question to me. My gut told me it's probably a no cell, but I put a question mark nonetheless. Also, we questioned this one. I think we tried that one earlier. So that was a questionable cell as well. Oh, then by symmetry, if this cell is questionable, rotate 90 degrees means that this cell is also questionable. Because if I had a solution for this one, just rotate it 90 degrees back, and I would have had a solution for that one as well. In fact, I can argue all of these four cells here are questionable. In fact, again, 90 degree rotation of this one gets me, where is it? Here. So that must be questionable. 90 degree rotation, questionable, and questionable. Ah, I'm starting to fill in the grid. Oh. Actually, I'm going to do more symmetry. If this cell is questionable, then I bet if I just reflect the image, this cell must also be questionable. Because if I had a solution here somehow, then I'll just reflect back, and that would have given me a solution there. So this cell must also be questionable. And I guess by 90 degree symmetry, all the side cells that are left over are also questionable. All right, OK. So then I was doing some systematic work here, but we see these four cells we haven't tried yet. All right, can they be done or can they not be done? Well, let's try it. So I'll start here. That's the right one, isn't it? Yep. And see if I can do a path that visits every cell exactly once with vertical and horizontal steps. And I'm just uh, trying it out here, not sure where I'm going. So far, no pickles. Everything's looking fine. Do I look OK? Look at that. It can be done. That's a yes. By rotational symmetry, that's a yes, that's a yes, that's a yes. All right. I know for sure that these Ys are definitely yes cells because we actually did it. But the puzzle for me was, are these questionable cells actually just questions? Could they be done if I tried harder? Or are they really no's? And that is the question that stuck with me for years. Are they really no cells? My gut was telling me they really were. Because I tried it lots and lots and lots and lots of times. I can never do it. But I wanted the logic behind it. Why would they be no cells? Maybe I just need to try one more time. OK. So that question stayed with me for, I don't know, a good six or seven years. And I remember walking to school in grade 10 one day, not particularly thinking about this problem, and a strange, wondrous epiphany just hit me. Out of the blue, I suddenly saw a logical reason why these question marks had to be no cells. So I'm going to give away my epiphany now. I'm going to give away the result that just makes it glaringly obvious why these are no's. OK, so if you want to wait for the epiphany yourself, maybe you want to pause for a moment and just go for a walk or something, because I'm about to give it away. Right, fair warning. So look at what we've got here. Have you noticed that the Y's and the question marks make a checkerboard pattern? Hmm. In fact, let me really make it obvious, the checkerboard pattern. So I'll actually color in some cells just like a checkerboard. So I've got some purple cells, and I'll have some white cells. All right. And look at that. How many purple cells are there? Well, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. That makes 10, and one, two, three. So the purple cells number in 13. And the white cells then must be 12 of them because there's 25 cells in all. 
one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two. The white cells come in 12 instead of 12. All right, so what? Well, notice all the question marks are in the locations of these white cells. So I'm wondering why would it be impossible to start a path on a white cell? So let's think about it. I'm on a white cell, so maybe my first cell is white. I'll actually write down W for my first cell is white. Whichever white cell I'm in, I've got no choice but to next walk into a purple cell. Whichever direction I go, the next cell has to be purple. Okay, if I'm in a purple cell, I must next go to, no matter where I am, into a white cell. And when I'm in a white cell, I must next go to a purple, then white, then purple, then white, then purple, then white, then purple, then white, then purple. Okay, how many steps is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, it's only twelve of the steps. I've got to keep going. White, then purple, 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 white, then purple. That's 24. Okay, there's 25 cells. I have to take one more step. I'm currently in a purple cell, and I have to take one more step. But we have a problem. Look, there are 12 white cells and 13 purple cells. And right now I've used up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 whites. And I've only used up 12 purples. We still have an extra purple to go. Which means I'm in a pickle because the next step, I've only got a purple to use, but it can't be purple because if it's purple, I'm in trouble. I'm meant to go to a white cell next. That's impossible. You cannot start in a white cell because you run out of the white cells before you've used, used up all the purple cells. But the only way this puzzle could possibly work is that that extra purple cell appears at the beginning. For this puzzle to work, you must start on a purple cell and look, indeed, we could do it if we did. Isn't that beautiful? That was an epiphany. That made me say, wow, there's something going on in this universe. It's just beautiful. OK, we're still only scratching the surface of things. Let's push play with this 5x5 five five grid even further. There are more surprises in store. But this time, let's view the 5x5 five five grid as an array of dots. Now, stare at this picture. It is certainly a picture of 25 dots. But can you see in this picture the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1? Now, it takes a moment. It takes an epiphany. Here goes. Look at the diagonals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The sum we seek matches the diagonals of the square. There are 25 dots in all. So without doing a lick of arithmetic, we can say the value of the sum must be 25. I love this. This picture is powerful. And it speaks beyond its literal self. What is the sum of the numbers 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 10, and back down again? Well, this sum must come from the diagonals of a 10 by 10 array of dots. And again, without a lick of arithmetic, the value of the sum must be 10 squared, 100. So, OK, here's the power. What is the sum of all the numbers from 1 up to 1,000 and back down again? Well, it must be 1,000 squared from a 1,000 by 1,000 array of dots. 1,000 squared is a million. Imagine trying to compute that on a calculator. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, all the way up to 1,000 and back down again. It would take forever. The picture here is mightier than the machine. The answer is available to us in the blink of an eye via this picture. The sum of the numbers 1 to 1,000 back down again is 1,000 squared from 1,000 by 1,000 array of dots. <laughs> OK, so what? Who cares about these sums? Well, actually, school curricula do. In my high school days, we had to memorize a general formula for the sum of numbers. The formula looked like this. The sum of the first n numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3, all the way up to some number n, is n squared plus n, all divided by 2. For example, the sum of the first five numbers, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, is 5 squared plus 5, 25 plus 5, that's 30. Then divided by 2 is 15. And one can check that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is indeed 15. Of course, as students, we wanted to know where this formula is coming from. Why is it true? Those were the burning questions in our minds, not just applying the formula to all the counting problems in my textbook. So how can we get this formula? Well, our 5 by 5 array of dots gave us something akin to this result. 
we have there that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 25. Can we get from this just the answer to 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5? Here's the lovely thing about doing mathematics. It's mostly about mulling and then following your nose. If we look at what we have, we see that the sum we want, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, is the left half of our equation. Well, I said half. That's not quite right. The right portion of the equation is missing a 5. <sighs> That's annoying. It's just the sum 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Wouldn't it be lovely to see 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 on that right half there as well? Here's a piece of general advice then. If there's something in life you want, just make it happen. And we'll be following this advice a lot in these lectures. We want to see an additional 5. So let's make it happen. Let's add a 5 on the left. And to keep things balanced, we need to add a 5 on the right as well. Lovely. Now we see two copies of what we want. Twice the sum we seek is 25 plus 5. So this means the sum itself is half of this. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is indeed 5 squared plus 5 divided by 2. And this matches the general formula I had to memorize. And there's nothing special about the number 5 here. The same ideas show that the sum of the numbers from 1 up to n, the sum of the first n counting numbers, that is, must be half of n squared plus n. There we have it. But let's keep going. In mathematics, there really is no such thing as being done with an idea or a concept or a picture. Look at the 5 by 5 grid of dots again. This time, let me ask, do you see the sum 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9? the sum of the first five odd numbers? Well, the answer is yes, as we can certainly circle these groups randomly and make them fit. But such a random picture isn't enlightening. We want to see a picture that isn't locked into this particular example of 25 dots. We want a picture that actually speaks to a higher truth and clearly holds for all possible square arrays. Mathematicians are always on the lookout for this sort of thing, and symmetry is often a pointer to higher truths. And we'll see the incredible power of symmetry throughout this course, in particular when we come to completely revolutionize some standard high school algebra with the power of symmetry in a couple of later lectures. But back to the matters at hand. Do you see 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 in a 5 by 5 array of dots in a way that speaks to a higher truth? Well, it takes another epiphany. This time, think L shapes. The sum of the first five odd numbers is hidden in the 5 by 5 array as L's. The sum 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 must be 5 squared, all 25 dots. 25. <laughs> in the same way, the sum of the first 10 odd numbers, 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11 plus 13 plus 15 plus 17 plus 19, sit in a 10 by 10 array of dots, and so must have the answer 100, the count of dots in that array. In general, the sum of the first n odd numbers must be n squared. Whoa. Actually, let me show you something stunning that Galileo noticed about the odd numbers. Galileo is revered today for his work in astronomy and physics and science and mathematics in general. Galileo thought to make fractions out of the odd numbers, and we'll play with fractions in a few lectures' time. For example, take the first five odd numbers and use their sum for the numerator of a fraction, and the sum of the next five odd numbers for the denominator. This gives a fraction that simplifies to one third. Okay, but do the same thing for the first two odd numbers followed by the next two. You get one third again. Do it again for the first 10 odd numbers followed by the next 10, and it's one third yet again. Galileo observed that all the fractions made out of the odd numbers this way are equal they all equal one third. These fractions are today called the Galilean ratios. When I shared this ob observation with some high school students back in 2009, they immediately saw a connection between the ratios and the L shapes and squares. Here's their purely visual proof of the Galilean ratios. Here, the first five L shapes, the sum of the first five odd numbers, make one block of 25 dots. The next five L shapes for the next five odd numbers makes three blocks of 25 dots. So the first five odd numbers make for one third of the next five odd numbers. Just beautiful.
Next lecture, we'll see how these students got negative numbers into these fraction ratios too. Amazing stuff. All right, now this focus on odd numbers is grand, but my gut is a little perturbed by this lopsided focus on matters. Are the results about sums of even numbers as well? For example, we have a picture of the sum of the first five odd numbers. Can we get from this a sum of the first five even numbers? 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus 10? Well, just add a dot to each L shape. Fabulous! This has turned the 5 by 5 square into a rectangle. The sum of the first five even numbers must be the 5 by 5 we had before, plus 5 more. 5 squared plus 5, which is 30. In general, the sum of the first n even numbers must come from the picture of n squared dots plus an extra n dots. n squared plus n. Now, as a mathematician, I'm feeling good. I feel we're coming full circle, as we've seen the expression n squared plus n before. Take the sum of the first five even numbers. It equals 5 squared plus 5. Now, divide everything by 2. 2 divided by 2, 4 divided by 2, 6 divided by 2, 8 and 10 each divided by 2, and finally, 5 squared plus 5 divided by 2. And we're back to the formula 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 equals 5 squared plus 5 all over 2. So indeed, we have come full circle. We're back to the formula I had to memorise back in school. Everything is hanging together so beautifully. All feels symmetrical, robust and pleasing. So that is the goal of this course, to show how mathematics, if seen the right way, and I really do mean seen, can become robust and complete and pleasing. And with that, a sense of ownership emerges. The confidence to play with ideas develops, and mathematics transforms from an experience of hazy thinking and memorization to powerful clarity, insight, and fun. As we've done this lecture, we'll look at topics that might be familiar from school days and general reading and push them to heights of joyful understanding. And we'll also explore topics that might not be familiar at all. Now, there is a general flow to the sequence of topics we'll follow, from counting, like we did today, to numbers and infinity, to algebra and clever mathematical applications. But the flow is loose, so feel free to bounce around between lectures if that takes your fancy. I am so excited. Let's get cracking.